On this episode of The Joe Roberts Show, Joe takes a moment to sit down with Ian Ippolito, the creator of the Real Estate Crowdfunding Review and the Private Investors Club. Ian is going to tell Joe all about the massive benefits you can gain from networking with a group of members to find and analyze deals and how collective capital raising often allows him to negotiate a better deal with a sponsor. Hear all about the benefits you can achieve from using his platform. Yeah, hello, Ian. Welcome to the show. Let's get rolling by giving us a brief background about your investing experience and what assets you invest in today. Sure. So I, I used to be a tech entrepreneur and I retired from that life in 2013 on a very good exit. And I kind of, uh, my new job was to find out, you know, how do I invest my money for my family? And at the time, real estate crowdfunding had just kind of come out. So I, I allocated some funds right away. You know, I did the traditional thing, which is like stocks and bonds and stuff like that. But I really wanted to check out alternative investments that might not be correlated directly with the stock market, give me some diversification. So I so started investing in a lot of real estate crowdfunding. I did a lot of research. At that time, there was almost no information out there. So I had to do it all on my own. And as a result of that, I compiled you know months of interviews of investors going into these different platforms and how they were doing and things like that. And uh, the word kind of got around that I had this really detailed thing and I got tired of emailing it to people. So I created a website basically and I put it all out there. And uh, so that's kind of how it all started. And, you know, today there's 12,000 investors coming in there every month, looking at everything about real estate crowdfunding. And then it kind of expanded into other things. So now it's all sorts of alternative investments. There's litigation finance, there's life settlements. Um, a lot of these are uh, music royalties. So a lot of these are not correlated to the, uh, not even correlated to real estate too. So, I mean, they're completely uncorrelated. So um, a lot of interesting stuff going on and I, I like that stuff. And so I invest myself too. All right. So you saw the, uh, I guess there was a lack of information out on the web. So you went out basically data mined all the, I guess what syndic syndic, you know, people that are syndicating deals and everything out there and kind of track the results. Well, yeah, and also, and not just got their information, uh, and, and some of them actually are not allowed to kind of post their information. They're marketing in a way where they can only deal with people they know, so you, you can't no, do much it. there, but you know what I'm talking about, but there's other ones that do public and market, so I put out what is there, but the other big thing was interviewing the investors that have invested with them and seeing what they think, because, yeah, it's one thing to kind of see it on the sponsor's point of view, but talking to the investors, sometimes you get a different point of view. So you went in depth with the other limited partners that were associated with certain deals to get the referrals or basically get all of their experience. Yes. Yes, exactly. Got it. And so when you say you went into uh, like, so right now with your site, what is that called? Okay. So that site is called the real estate crowdfunding review. Okay. So it talks about all these different crowd. There, there's, there's many crowdfunding platforms that are out there. Some of them will have a lot of deals. They might have a hundred deals out there. Other ones are small. They might have one or two, but um, yeah. And then, so they, they kind of, each one I looked and I thought, well, how did they structure their deals? If they go bankrupt, am I going to lose all my money? Or, you know, uh, is there some, something that's going to protect me in case they don't? And then, you know, how much, do they put any skin into the game in these things? Or are they just, you know, uninvolved and, you know, and there's good and bad, you know, and all these different things. And so I just kind of, and, and, but the biggest thing was the investor feedback. Do you, are people happy with it or are they unhappy? And I kind of did that and kind of came up with my own idea of which ones I liked and which ones I didn't like and, and just put it out there. And so that's the real estate crowdfunding review. And so right now, is it free for anybody to sign up? How can you join? Yeah, absolutely free. People just go in. Uh, there's nothing to join actually, unless they want to get the newsletter, which gets sent out every week. I actually have a, a newsletter where I kind of analyze what's going on uh, with the pandemic and COVID-19 and how it may or may not be affecting different investments and alternative investments. So that you sign up for, but it's also free. And then kind of behind the real estate crowdfunding review. So, so I put that out there, which was great, but you can only talk about investments so much kind of in this public space. And, you know, a lot of it's protected under NDA and stuff like that. So I created a private club and this private club is protected by an NDA. So basically if someone, there's no charge to join the club, but if someone comes into the club, they have to agree to keep everything confidential. That's the key. And by doing that, we can all share our experiences with these different sponsors. We, we can share incoming deal flow, um, even with those 506B offerings that would normally not be allowed to you know, publicize, you can share with people that you know. 
So now we can get access to those. Um, and we do due diligence, group due diligence. So, you know, maybe I don't know everything about this particular thing, but th there's over 4,500 people. So someone else probably in the club does know. And so together we will just hammer on these deals. And by the time we do that, people have a pretty good idea of some of the risks where before maybe they didn't. And then we will band together to try to negotiate, you know, some sort of discount or something like that if, if it looks good. All right. So, so these someone, are all the things that are in the private club. Cool. So someone signs up, they, they log in, they have access to uh, view these deals under an NDA. Obviously they can't share outside the club, right? Right. And these type of deals, they can be anything, majority are real estate syndication, but along with that, you have some other types. And can you, what are those other different types that you have? Yeah, yeah. You know, originally it was 100% real estate. And now I would say it's maybe only 60% real estate and about 40% all these other alternative investments. So there's the, the kind of exotic ones, which are like litigation finance, which is you're investing in a court case. So whether that wins or loses, you get paid. So that has nothing to do with the economy. It has nothing to do with the stock market. It has nothing to do with real estate. It's just how well they pick. So completely uncorrelated, which is nice for a portfolio for diversification. There's um, another one is like uh, music royalties. So, you know, here, because of the pandemic, lots of people are spending time at home and, uh, and people want to stream music or they watch videos and they watch a movie and, you know, every time music is played in the background, that's a music royalty. So those type of investments have been doing pretty good. Um, there's life settlements, which is, it sounds kind of strange, but it's basically investing in someone's life insurance policy. So someone, what people don't realize is people buy a life insurance policy and the idea is when they die, it pays them a certain amount. But people don't realize that I think it's something like 90% of the people that do these things don't pay all the way to the end. And so then they lose their coverage and the insurance company basically gets to keep it. So uh, it's very lucrative for the insurance companies. Well, what these companies figured out is, hey, this person that's about to stop paying on their life insurance policy, I'll, I'll offer them some money for it. And I'll offer them a lot more money than they can get by just like surrendering their policy to the insurance company, maybe five times as much. So the, the person with the policy loves it. And now this other company owns the policy, this an investor or a fund. And, uh, you know, and they make the payments because they can do so. And then when the person passes away, they collect. So this has, again, has nothing to do with the economy. It's just, you know, it's, it's based on things that are totally uncorrelated. So again, can be really good for a portfolio. And then we just have things that are maybe a little bit more that people probably have heard more of, which are things, but not real estate, like private equity. So it's going into a company, maybe it's distressed or something and try to turn it around. Uh, there's venture capital investing where it's trying to identify these kind of startup companies that look like they're going to do well. Everyone wants to find the next Facebook, or, you know, <laughs> so, you know, it's investing in that um, and kind of everything in between. So it's all these things that are just, the only thing is just that it's not publicly traded. So it's not going to be something you buy from your broker not going to be a mutual fund, an ETF, or a stock, or a bond, but it's everything else. Now, a, a sponsor, general partner uh, has a deal. How do they how do they approach you? Is it you that uh, allows them on the platform? Is it a group decision? How does that filter? Well, uh, it, yeah, it's not my decision because you know the other thing about the club is that we're very we understand that everyone's different. So you know maybe I think something is not a good fit for me, but someone else is going to think it's great. We all have different risk tolerances. We all come from different financial situations and we have different goals. So, you know, it's not for me to say this is a terrible deal or this is a great deal. So, yeah. So, you know, any sponsor can come to the club. So I might introduce the sponsor or maybe another club member might. And then we will just post the information about them. And then we'll ask for more information from them. Um, and then that kind of just builds on its own. People say, well, what about this? Or what about that? If it's a real estate deal, well, can I see the pro forma? Uh, what kind of assumptions were made behind that pro forma? How much debt do you have? Um, you know, what do you, what, how have you stress tested this pro forma for a recession? You know, things like that. So we just kind of dig into it and dig into it. And then after we're done, sometimes we'll have a webinar. We'll say, hey, people like to talk to the sponsor in person. So we might have a webinar. And, uh, and then after that, typically, you know, people are ready to invest or not invest, whatever their choice is. And now is there typical minimum amounts to participate or, you know, what happens, I guess, one, is there a minimum amount to invest? And then two, what if there's just too many people or not enough people? 
<laughs> yeah, all of those things happen. So it's like, uh, yeah, uh, the, the minimums are set by these sponsors. So usually the lowest is 25,000, but it can be as high as 5 million. So it's all over the place. And obviously the higher it is, the more difficult it is to, to get people to come in. But, um, you know, and we have both situations. We have situations where just not enough people are interested. And then we have other ones where just everybody floods in and then the deal is full. So, you know, it's just, and it's one of those things. And we have one right now where a lot of people are going to get cut off, unfortunately. And, you know, it's very sad and disappointing. And especially if someone's put in a lot of due diligence when that happens, what I just say is, look, you know, we get probably a hundred new investments coming in every month. So it's very disappointing. It's very sad, but there's going to be something else. So, you know, don't get so hung up on, you know, the ones that you miss out on. There, there's going to be another one. It's like a bus. There'll be another bus that comes around. And so when there is a, I guess a certain, let's call it, uh, how do you guys do you, how do you guys profit yourselves? Do you guys profit off of this? <laughs> well, um, so we don't charge people to join and it, it's an important reason because we have no conflicts of interest that way. So if we charge people to join or if we, took money for referring people to certain sponsors, then all of a sudden people can't trust that, you know, the information that they're getting is, is neutral. So we don't do any of that. So, so basically two ways. So basically we take donations for people who want to volunteer to donate. And then sometimes the club creates these feeders where on those really big funds where it's a $5 million minimum, we might aggregate our money together to try to meet that minimum. And so then the, the, the club takes a fee um, and it makes money off of that. So, uh, but that's basically it. And it's on purpose. It's basically to avoid having conflicts of interest and have information that people can trust. You got it. And when you utilize that feeder fund, is that where you get involved in kind of spe- setting up a special purpose entity or vehicle through a, yes. a, a partner or something? Exactly. Exactly. So we, we set that up and then that way we invest through a, a third party administrator. And that third party administrator, are you allowed to go into details about them or kind of why you use them and, and maybe how they help facilitate all the transactions? Well, yeah, everything in the club is like covered by an NDA, of course, as I mentioned. So, you know, I can't mention any names about things, but uh, what I can say is that it's, it's very nice to have a professional that's in charge of that sort of thing that you can trust that the accounting is going to be right and all of that because there's just uh, lots of ways to mess something like that up. So, you know. I recommend using someone that is very experienced. No, I agree. There's so many third-party uh, vendors these days available for all aspects of the syndication that it's well worth the money just to outsource it, correct? Yes, that's exactly right. <laughs> because all you need is one little mess up that happens and then all of a sudden the investor doesn't trust anything. So um, yeah, I think it's well worth it. So t- and typically when the sponsors come in, uh, you know, are they, is there typically a track record with them? that kind of demonstrates their returns that they have over the past or is there a required uh, experience, right? Yes, 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 exactly. Uh, so that's like the first thing most people look at. So they're gonna wanna see the track record. They're gonna wanna see both the, for real estate, they're gonna wanna see both the realized deals. So the ones that have been sold, but also the ones that are just sitting there and haven't sold because there are some sponsors that they look great if you look just at the realized but then when you go to the unrealized, they have some really bad ones that are just sitting there for forever and they're not selling because they don't want to realize them. So, um, you know, or they can't sell maybe because they're underwater. So, so we want to look at the whole thing. And then some investors, the more conservative ones, want to require a longer track record. They might require someone that has even gone through a full real estate cycle, you know, with maybe little or no money lost. Other ones are fine with, with someone that taking a chance on someone that's brand new, you know, if they like what they see. And most people I'd say are probably somewhere in the middle where they're going to acquire either, you know, either more or less based on what they're looking for. And like I said, everyone is different. So uh, we don't try to say that one particular way is right. All the ways of doing due diligence are, are right for that particular investor. What do you see are some of the most key points when it comes to doing due diligence or what do you see people most focus on, put as much emphasis on when they're looking at all these deals? I kind of see two ways of approaching it. There are the people that do uh, bottom or I should say top down. So they'll start with the sponsor first. They don't even look at the deal. And actually this is the way I do it, but look at the sponsor first. Don't even look at the deal. And um, because of that, because I do it that way, I can weed out people very quickly. So I don't have to look at a lot of deals. Even I mean, I do look at a lot of deals, but uh, I get rid of them very quickly. So um, 
Now, the opposite way is to just dive right into the deal itself, which is, which is perfectly legitimate too. So people will start looking at, you know, what's the debt on this? What is the skin in the game? You know, how much, how much money is the sponsor putting alongside me so that if there's a loss, they will take it too. That makes me feel that I know they have my best interest at heart. How much, so like what, how high is the LTV? Are they using fixed rate or floating rate? And, and different people want different things. Some people want a fixed rate loan because they want to eliminate the interest rate risk. Some people want a floating rate because it's cheaper and they're not concerned about interest rates going up. So everyone has their own criteria. Um, then people will look at the fees, the promote, and they'll kind of compare that to others and say, is this competitive? And if it's not competitive, then hmm, do I love this deal or this sponsor enough that it's worth it? Or is it just not worth it and, and I'll pass? So I think those are kind of the things. And then it's jumping into, so usually that's kind of like the high level on the sponsor or on the deal. And then you can go low level. If they pass all of that, then you start diving into the pro forma and say, well, what kind of assumptions are being made here? Um, is rent going up at a reasonable amount every single year or is it going up like 8% per year, which is like impossible? Are they, you know, uh, are expenses looking reasonable or are they like keeping them the same year after year, which like, you know, never happens. Expenses always go up. So, you know, there's lots of ways to dive into the pro forma to kind of look at these financial numbers. And then there's analysis of the legal documents. So it's looking for those little gotchas. Um, like for example, just in the promote structure, there's a million different ways to write it. Sometimes the investor will get back a return of capital first before they have to pay the promote. Other times they don't. It's really important to understand the difference because it can make a big difference. So um, just going through the PPM itself is a huge, you know, going through the legal documents is a huge undertaking. I don't like to do it unless I'm really, really liking the sponsor because I'll, I'll spend like a couple of days going through there. So, um, but everyone has their own way. Some people will just go right to the risk section and kind of look at those and say, hmm, can I, can I live with these? Can I not live with those? And kind of do it that way. I agree. At the end of the day, it's the uh, the horse and jockey, right? The uh, the, the general partner yeah. is leading the deal and managing it. Ultimately, a lot of the success falls in his hands. And then after that, you kind of look at the deal location and asset, right? Yeah, that, that's how I do it. Exactly. I, I want to see the jockey first. Yeah. And only then do I even look because I've seen great deals ruined by jockeys that are not that great. So I don't want to waste my time with that. But some people are fine with it, or maybe they're like, hey, if the deal's good enough, you know, I, I can compromise on the sponsor. So if that's what they feel, you know, that's fine. And typically in this environment, what are people looking for in regards to a return profile? Like IRR, you know, are they looking out at a three, five, 10 year hold or, you know, what are, what are those things people are looking for today? I, I think there's kind of different groups that are looking for different things. You, you do... There is a resistance, I would say, for really short-term stuff, just because there's so much unknown going on right now. You know what's going to happen. So people are not not a lot of people are wanting the really short-term stuff that I'm seeing. I am seeing an appetite for kind of these construction deals that don't have to do any lease up. So uh, for your listeners, I mean, I know you know, but for your listeners, you know, construction deals have some additional risks that say a value added is not going to have because you've got to go through this permitting process. You've got to build. Hopefully, you're going to be on schedule. You may or may not be. Then when you're done, you have to lease the whole thing up. And, you know, so uh, so that's additional risk on top of a value-added deal. But a lot of people are looking at that now as an advantage because they're like, well, it's going to be a couple of years before this is even ready to lease up. By then, maybe the stuff that's going on with the economy now will be all flushed out, and I won't have to worry about it. So there's kind of that point of view of some people. So they're looking at, like, Three to five year construction deals is what the, some people are looking for. Other people are like, well, I don't know what's going on. I just want to have like a really long term thing where I figure in seven to 10 years, any turbulence that we're going through now probably won't matter. So in the bigger scheme, so you have people looking for that. Um, you have some people, I'd say right now, most people are avoiding certain asset classes in real estate. They are avoiding hotels. They're generally avoiding retail. Um, they're avoiding, you know, restaurants. Uh, you know, they're avoiding anything that's been really, really hard hit and may or may not come back right away. Just because it's so hard to say when, you know, when is it going to start hitting pro forma or, and stop being distressed. You do have a, a small number of people, though, that look at it as an opportunity and they are more aggressive. And they're saying, hey, I want some distressed deals. And I think, you know, it'll work out in such a way. 
So these people are, are making their bets and going into these more distressed areas and, and looking for bargains. Do you find that people that have been uh, in LP, I guess, for many years, or maybe like yourself, do you end up uh, investing with the majority of the same sponsors over time and then only bring in an occasional new one? Um, maybe in a way, yes, but I would say it's not because of the familiarity, just because like from my point of view, I'm very fussy. So it's hard to find a good sponsor and like, and then when I like, I put in so much effort and when I find one that I like, I'm like, it's hard not to just keep pumping money into them every time they have a new deal. I, as long as they're the same. So, you know, so that's kind of what happens with me, but there are also other people that kind of approach it from a different area where maybe they're not doing as much due diligence on each sponsor or they have different criteria. A more aggressive investor is going to find, you know, they might find 20 or 30 potential sponsors in a month that they can invest in. So they're going to be, they're going to probably diversify into a whole bunch of different sponsors. So it kind of just depends. I got you. Some take the spray and pray and some concentrate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. How does the, I guess, collective capital raising of the group, does that allow you to get better deals? Do you guys negotiate more things or more equity of the deal from the sponsors? Yeah, that's what we do. So if there's not much interest, there's nothing we can do. But if we start to bring a substantial amount to the table, then we will go to the sponsor and say, hey, look, it looks like we can bring you X amount of money. Um, can you please, you know, do this? Can you please change the promote? Can you please, you know, uh, give us a, a lower management fee? Um, can you lower the minimum? You know, uh, that sort of thing. And, and most sponsors, you know, they are wanting to close the deal and they appreciate you know, that the club is going to do due diligence and then all the members know it. It's not like they have to do a whole bunch of due diligence a million times on all these individual investors. So it saves them time. And so uh, a lot of times we're able to do that. That's good. And is this club only open to uh, accredited or also non-accredited? It is. Originally, we were just basically anyone. And what happened is we found that, you know, we have so few deals for non-accredited investors. And, um, so uh, it really has become an accredited investor club. And I think now at this point, actually, we have people that apply that are non-accredited. We just tell them, look, there's just not that many deals out there. Um, we'll put you on a waiting list if the situation changes, you know, but, you know, right now there's aren't. So right now it is accredited. So basically anybody who's accredited, looking for deal flow, located all across the country, community of other LPs that discuss it, filter, have yeah. a network, you're the place to go. Yep, that's exactly right. <laughs> I think we covered, all, I mean, pretty much everything. Is there any other thoughts into what you're doing that you'd like to share? Um, no, I think you, you pretty much hit it all. It's, for me, it's always been about the due diligence and the fact that a group can always know things that I can't, which I love. And, you know, there's people catch me all the time. They're like, I, I, I come up with a theory and I'm like, blah, blah, blah. blah. And someone says something. And I'm like, yeah, you're right. You're right. I, I didn't think of that. So it's a great that's thing. Good. That's good. We have a final question. What is the biggest thing you have implemented that has increased your net worth? Oh, well, actually, uh, it's that. So once I switched to being a passive investor, you know, the biggest changes to my net worth are in my investment techniques and things like that. And I made some mistakes early on. You know, I really didn't know what I was doing. And I invested in some things that I later now now I would never touch. So um, the biggest thing for me was to develop my own due diligence strategy and to follow it so it's both so it's like it took a long time to figure it out and then it takes even more discipline to make sure you follow it because the other thing is like when you feel like well at least for a conservative investor like me you know when you see other people going on and, and they're just throwing their money down on these really interesting things with you know they might have high irrs you know whatever whatever it is but for some reason it's not a fit you know, it takes a lot of discipline. So I think the two things together are, are really important. Well, that's good. And sometimes the pro forma displays in IR, but the actual results may vary, right? <laughs> exactly. Yes. And, and, and so I'm sure through your due diligence, so I'm sure through your sure you're through your due diligence that you probably actually get to your own projection of where the IRR and, and see if that matches up. And that probably yeah. allows you to make better decisions, right? Yes, yes, exactly. And then it's like, oh, okay, now with this adjustment, do I still feel comfortable or not? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's it's interesting interesting that you said that uh, that was definitely new for the show today, due diligence. And you know, thinking back now, I mean, a lot of investments, and I've seen people just jump in, just thinking that, hey, I got money, I can spend it. it. Should just automatically return me money. And I've definitely seen a lot of people lose money in that fashion by not having a, a concrete plan or something to follow. Yes. 
Yes. And it's so easy to get diverted. Like for me, I, I started off with making, I didn't start this way, but I eventually went with, with having like, how much am I going to put in each category in my portfolio? So it doesn't get out of whack. If you don't, and which I didn't do at the beginning, you, you just say, oh, well, this came through. That looks good. Oh, that looks good. And then you end up with all your money in something and then, you know, hardly anything in the other. And it's just totally undiversified. So, yeah. That's great. Way. If people want to get a hold of you, what's the best way to do that? So head on over to the Real Estate Crowdfunding Review. There's a contact information there. They can also sign up for the club too as well. I appreciate Ian for coming on today. Thank you. Yeah, my pleasure, Joe. Thank you. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching my latest interview. If you like what you saw, please click the subscribe button below to become a member of the Joe Robert community. Be sure to hit the bell to turn on all notifications so you always know when I post a new video. Tell me what you thought about the content in the comments below. I always read them and would love to answer any of your questions.